welcome everybody welcome all our touring time viewers so tonight we are learning Le'iloi Nishmas Zechariah Shimon ben Rav Yitzhak Akayin and Avram ben Chaim Yehuda and Yechaskel ben Avram and Rav Shlomo Zalman ben Rav Yitzhak Akiva ben Sion. Before we begin, one, one uh, quick announcement. Um, there is a amazing organization that's been around for a while, but now has have a little bit of more access to other people. Uh, it's, it's an organization that has seen tremendous amount of brachas, of siyata dishmaya, of, of miracles, of nisim. And it's, it's a very, very simple, uh, well, simple, but simple to hear, harder to do. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an organization which speaks a daily, there's a daily recording on SNES. And you're able to call in, you're able to go to the website at uh, www.miraculoussalvations.com spelled exactly how you think it. If not, just Google Miraculous and then you figure out how to spell that, salvations.com. And you could sign up over there and it's, uh, or you could call the number, which is uh, 1929-946-8566. And there is Nisim and Eflais, there's miracles that have seen by this, where you go and you listen, it's a little bit of a luck, a little bit of a story, a very, you know, not that long, uh, very entertaining. And of course, whatever you listen, you should try to implement in your own life. And there's a tremendous amount of blessing that comes from modesty. And even if you're not holding there, maybe this will get you there. So I strongly recommend to visit the website, listen to the recording, and, uh, and, and change your life. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. It's pretty much what we're doing over here, right? as we're trying to do, get everyone to change their life. So getting ready for, for Tisha B'Av. Um, I don't know if it's just me, but it's like, it's always a shock when Tisha B'Av, you know, just comes. It's just like, what, like already? You know, there's some, some days during the year that just come and people are very aware of it. And I'll tell you the two big ones. It's Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. Probably a small reason why is because there is fasting involved and it's difficult and you have to sit on the floor and you have to cry and if you don't cry then are you really a good Jew? I don't know. Like you know like there's so many things and, and both days by the way, right? Right, Yom Kippur, you want to be able to to dive and talk of this Baruch On Tisha B'Av, you want to mourn for the base of Mikdash. So in these days that I, that stick out and when these days come, it's almost like, wait a minute, already? It's already Tisha B'Av? And by the way, you know, speaking about Yom Kippur, you know, like if Tisha B'Av was over here, Yom Kippur is like just right around the corner. How scary is that? Um, and, you know, so, so it, it kind of like pops out, like, you know, like time is moving super duper fast. I hope that we try to accomplish uh, whatever we can during the time that we have on this amazing planet called Earth. So... I want to share with you an I, you know, I shouldn't say an idea. It's a bunch of thoughts um, that I found, uh, you know, very, very interesting. Very, very like like mechadesh, a different, you know, like novel ideas on on uh, Tisha B'av. And this is from Rav Shimshon Pinkus. There is a parak in Tehillim, chapter seventy-nine, verse one. And this Parak and Tehillim, uh, Parak Ayin Tes, chapter 79, speaks about the destruction of the base of Mikdash. And in the, the Tehillim, it starts off with Mizmor Asaf, a song from Asaf. Now the Medrash in Eicher Rabbah, in the fourth chapter, goes on and says, wait a minute, we're speaking about the destruction of the Beis Amikdash. We're, we're, we're speaking about the destruction of the holy temple of where the Jewish people were able to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why does it start off with a song? Mizmar? That's how you start off with a song? If anything, you should start it off as, a, you know, like a mourning to Asaf, a wailing to Asaf, a eulogy to Asaf. There's so many other words. Why are we starting off with a Mizmar, a song? This is a time of sorrow. This is a time of, of, of sadness. This is a time not of song, of joyfulness. So, the... The, the, the Medrash goes on and says that what happened was is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was going to go and destroy the Jewish people. 
because they were falling. But instead, HaKadosh Baruch Hu vented his anger, so to speak, and we'll soon see what that means, on the, on the base of Mikdash. Now, the, the Medrash goes and says like this. It goes and says that, imagine, it brings a story. Imagine you had a king who had a son, and he built this beautiful chamber for his son, and uh, the son, unfortunately, went off the path he wasn't on the same path that the king wanted him to be. And he started getting uh, involved with bad things, and he started going on the wrong path, and he ended up doing, you know, evil, evil things, wicked things. So the king went and ran into this chamber, this, this like palace, this room that, that the king built, and he started ripping down the court curtains, destroying the room. When this king's son saw, when, when, the, when the teacher, I'm sorry, of the king's son saw what the king was doing, he sat down and he began to play his flute. And he was playing his flute, playing a musical you know, instrument while the king is destroying this room. So the people went over to him and says, I don't understand, what are you doing? You're the teacher of the prince. Why are you so happy right now that the king is destroying the son's room? And the, the teacher goes and says, Look at how amazing it is. What do you mean? He says the king was very, very angry, very upset at his son. He's venting out, so to speak, the anger on the room and not on his son. And that's a great thing. Like, I'm so glad that he's not, and my, this is my student, and he's not doing anything to the student. Instead, he decided to destroy the room that he built for the student. So, of course, I'm going to be happy because the student is going to survive. The prince is going to survive. <clears throat> and this is what the major says. It says, Kach amru le'asaf. This is what they said to Asaf. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hechev Hechal Umigdash. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is destroying the base of Migdash. Vata Yoshev Umezamir? You're sitting over here and you're singing a song for Asaf. It says in the over here. Mizmer le Asaf. Amar lahem. Asaf replied to them. Mizamer ani. I'm singing now. I'm singing the song now. Sheshafa HaKadosh Baruch Hu Es Chamasa Yala Itzim Valavanim. The HaKadosh Baruch Hu God went and he took out his chamasa, his wrath, on the stones and the sticks. And he didn't turn his wrath onto Klal Yisrael. So first of all, we have to ask a question. Like, what does it mean? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is angry? What is he, he's venting? Hey, imagine you have a guy who's really, really angry, and he's got into a fight with his wife or with his child, and he goes over to the wall and he punches a hole through the wall. And everybody's like, wow, that's amazing. He punched the wall and he didn't punch his wife. Like that, so like he vented it out. Like this is how we understand the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Like what's going on over here? How do we begin to understand this concept? Okay, like this is a famous idea that we know that Kaddish Baruch Hu put his anger on the base of Megdash and other Jewish people. But how do we understand that? Kaddish Baruch Hu is not a human being that just, you know, like, gets angry. When we speak about these terms in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's not that he's actually angry or happy or anything like that. It's terms that we're able to understand it. It's anthropomorphic. It's, it's terms that human beings are able to comprehend, to understand HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Not that HaKadosh Baruch Hu got angry and now we have to appease him and we daven, then he's going to be happy. Of course, he's going to be happy because he wants us to be able to succeed, but not the fact that, you know, there's, it's like a moody situation. So in order to explain this, I want to share with you two stories. There was once an artist, master artist, that he wanted, his, uh, he wanted to create a painting that is going to be his magnum opus. It's going to be his, his like painting that everybody's going to be like, whoa, like this is the painting of this amazing painter. And, <clears throat> you know, he had tremendous amount of talent. And he's been painting for many, many years, but like nothing stuck out. So he decided he's going to make this huge, magnificent, lifelike painting. He goes up to a mountain and he builds this tremendous like easel that he's able to put this huge canvas and he's going to make it very, very lifelike of the scene that he sees. And he's sitting over there for days, which turns into weeks. Day and night, almost till, from the full day until it gets nighttime, he's sitting over there and he's painting and he's working so meticulously, so carefully, he wants to make sure that everything is perfect on this painting. After a few weeks, he's finally, she finally finishes this painting <clears throat> and his friend just happens to come and, and to, to look at it. He climbs up the mountain and says, you've been working on something for weeks, I want to see it already. So he goes up and he's like, wow, this is unbelievable. Such a lifelike painting. He sees the mountains and the trees and there's birds flying. It was so realistic. <clears throat> but who is more, you know, who can critique a painter better than himself? 
He's going and he's like, no, I have to make sure that it's perfect. And he's, because the painting was so huge, he had to take it, he, he painted it in sections. So he, in order to see the whole thing, you have to take a step back. You have to look at it from, an, from, from, far, from far enough that you're able to see the whole thing. So he's looking at it, for, he starts off close up and he starts looking at all the details and he's satisfied with what he sees. Then he takes a step back. So how does it look from this angle? And then he takes another step back. How does it look from this angle? And he's stepping back, stepping back and is completely mesmerized by, the, by his painting and focusing with complete meditation and concentration. The whole world is dead. He's going over there. Meanwhile, his friend is looking at him. He's spending an hour just staring at this painting and he's on a, he's on a mountain, there's a cliff. And the friend starts going and says, you're, you're gonna fall off, be careful, where are you going? And he was far, he was, he was getting further and further, but the guy was, the artist was so enveloped in his painting that he didn't hear his friend at all. His whole, the whole world was dead to him. And the friend is screaming and screaming and they realize that with one more step and that's it. The guy is falling to his death. And the friend realized he doesn't have enough time to run to the guy and drag him back. So he had only one thing that he could do. He ran to the painting, which was close by. He had a pocket knife and he starts slashing the painting, crossing it, you know, like, and things are falling off. The artist wakes up from his trance. He's like, are you crazy? Like, what are you doing? This is my life work. I've spent so many weeks on this. My blood, sweat, and tears are in this. What are you doing? And the friend screams back to him, I just saved your life. Look behind you. And he looks behind him and he doesn't see anything. He looks down at the cliff. He was one step away from sudden death from instant death <clears throat> and thankfully his friend saved his life. The Jewish people were one step away from sudden death and HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to save us. How did he save us? He saved us by destroying the base of Mikdash. Still difficult to understand so let me explain you another story. Listen to this amazing story. This is a story that has to be heard and listened to every single year before Tisha B'Av. It's unbelievable. The Dubna Magid goes and says as follows. There was once this couple, this amazing couple, this couple that, you know, one of those couples that they just do good for everybody at all times, at every, they're just like an amazing, amazing couple. The house was always open. They were very, Baruch they were blessed with a lot of money. They were very wealthy. The husband was very successful. They always had guests coming into their house. They had, most of the rooms were just guest rooms. They, you know, if somebody came in hungry, he left sat, satiated, he left with his pockets full, whatever, if he was collecting for money, everybody went to them, left happy. And not only that, they weren't, you know, some people that have money are in a certain, you know, level. Okay, I'll help you to a certain extent. This couple, it's like they got down and dirty. It's like, oh, you're making a brisk? Do you need help schlepping tables? Do you need help doing this? They went and they physically schlepped and they sweat and they, they, it, there was no, you know, standard for them. Like, oh no, we have to be, <laughs> you know, we're the wealthy people in town. We have to be like this. No, no, no. Anything that the people needed, they were there to help. They were there, they had an um, unbelievable shalom bias. You know, people came over to them with their problems, whether it's in business, and the guy gave advice, and he loaned them money, and gave them free loans, and maybe opened the business for them. And then if somebody had marriage problems, they sat together with the, cup, the husband and wife, and they were able to talk it out and be like, okay, why don't you try this? Like free marriage advice, free business advice. They were unbelievable on all angles. Even though people were wondering, like, wait a minute, when does this guy work? He's signing checks all day. He's helping people all day. He's never in the office. And Taka, he was actually close to bankruptcy because he was just helping so much. It's too much that he was, you know, draining his bank account. He wasn't able to work. But you could imagine the love, the respect, the admiration that people had for this couple. And this couple was the, the leaders of this generation, even though he wasn't the biggest rabbi. And even though, you know, she wasn't the biggest rabbi, but everybody realized this couple, everybody loved them. Like, they just gave so much to the community. There was one issue, and that issue was, is that this couple didn't have any children. And everybody was davening for this couple, like literally everybody, even people that didn't have children were davening for them, like, come on God, like these people are amazing. You got, like, like these are unbelievable people. There are certain people that, you know, people can get jealous of, but there are certain people that you can't get jealous of, them, even if they're blessed with so much, but they just give so much. They're nonstop giving. Those people like are protected from it, like an Ayinara, they're protected from jealousy. People just love them. There was mamish, nothing, no one can say anything negative about them. And the years went on, and they didn't have any children. 20 years go by. And they try all the mikubalim, all the doctors, everybody. They, what stone didn't they? Money was not an issue. They tried everything and anything, but unfortunately it wasn't successful.
20 years go by and uh, suddenly there's news that spreads through town like wildfire. It's like, did you hear? They're pregnant. No one had to say their name. People said, they're pregnant. <gasps> Are you serious? It's been 22 years. I got a And everybody re instantly, they are pregnant. Everybody was diving. They went out. Are you okay? Do you need anything? Maybe I get you. You don't say, you know, nobody wanted to bother them. Nine months, we're not going to bother you. Come on, you're pregnant. You know, like everybody bent over backwards, whatever they could do to help this amazing couple. Finally, nine months go by and the time comes. The, the wife goes and says, you know, it's time to go to the hospital. And they rush to the hospital and uh, the doctor quickly takes a look at it, takes him in, starts doing some scans, starts, starts looking and then he goes and he says, to the husband, usually the husband would, you know, depending on the type of uh, background that you have, either it's going to be in the room or right outside the room. But the, the doctor goes over to the husband and says, I'm sorry, but you have to wait in the waiting room. He says, uh, there, there's a little bit of a complication over here. Like, like nobody could be inside. No family is allowed to be inside. And the, the, the father, the, you know, the husband's like, he's like, what do you mean the complications? Like, is everything okay? Like, this is my wife. We've been waiting 22 years for this baby. Like, you can't, like, is everything, you know, like, you could, the doctor's like, listen, we're gonna do whatever we can. Just do me a favor, stay outside. The husband goes outside. Oh, if somebody knows what tears are, this, he's like, what's, what's, he didn't even know what's happening. He's sitting over there. He added to hell and he started crying and davening like he never davened before. Please, Akadosh Baruch, I'm begging you. Please save my, help my wife, help my child. An hour goes by and it feels like an eternity. And five hours go by, so it's five eternities. And finally the doctor comes out. And the doctor's not smiling, not happy, he's very serious. And the, the husband's like, he's like, he's like, Doc, what's going on? He's like, you, you gotta give me some good news. He says, I have no more tears left. And the doc doctor says, listen, listen it, you know, she's still in labor. There is a complication that, you know, I've tried everything I can, but unfortunately, I can only save one. It's either, your wife or the baby? And he goes over to the husband and says, you have to tell me, you have to choose which one do I save? And the husband goes and says, he says, he says, what? He says no, save both of them. We're like, what are you talking about? He says, you gotta save both of them. The doctor says, we tried for five hours. We can't save both of them. We can only save one. You have to choose. You have to tell me, who do you want me to save? And the husband's like, I can't make that decision. So, you know, so the, the doctor goes and says, go run to your rabbi, speak to your rabbi, do something, we gotta go fast. The guy runs to his rabbi. And he goes to the rabbi and he says, rabbi, you gotta help me out over here. This is a situation that quickly plays it out. And the rabbi quickly responds, says, you know, why are you asking, did you speak to your wife? What did your wife say? He says, uh, to be honest, I, I, didn't even, like, I didn't even think I can't, uh, you know, like you run, before I even finished mumbling a sentence, he runs back to the hospital. He says, doc, can I speak to the wife? Can I speak to my wife? And he's like, you know, she's in and out of consciousness, but, she, but she's with it, you know, like, you, you could definitely, uh, uh, you know, speak to her. So the husband goes over to the wife, and he wasn't sure at this point what to decide. The wife, the child, like, uh, like well, he doesn't know what's the right thing to do. He takes one look at his wife with all the tubes and how she's looking and frail and sick and just like drained five hours in labor. She's not doing well. At that instant, he realized, I'm saving my wife. I can't, this is the love of my life. You know, this is somebody that I wish, that, that married, I'd do anything for her. And he goes over to his wife and he says, he explains the situation. He says, the doc says this, I went to the rabbi, the rabbi told me I should ask you, you know, like, we can only save one. He says, but don't worry, he says, I made my decision. I decided I'm gonna save you. And the wife looks at him, very serious, <clears throat> all of a sudden very alert, very focused. And she's like, don't I have a say in this? And the husband's like, he's like, you know, like didn't even think about it. He's like, well, of, of, of course you have a say in it. Like, you know, like, what, what do you want to say? And she goes over to him and she says, listen, he says, you know, I've carried this child for nine months. I have a connection to this child. This child, you know, we connected for nine months. This is my baby. And I know that it ain't happening again. You know, like this is the only chance that we have to have a legacy. This is the only chance that we can have an offspring. This is what we've wanted for 22 years. The money, the fame, the power, all that means nothing to us. You know, this is all that we wanted. We would have given everything up just for this. And she goes over to her husband with tears streaking down her cheeks. And she says, I also have made my decision. And my decision is that I choose my child. And the husband starts crying, says, but my dear wife, you don't know what that means. That means that you're not walking out of this hospital. And she's like, I know, I know. Says, 
I still choose my child, but I have one condition. She goes over to her husband and says, when this child becomes of age, I want you to take this child to the cemetery. I want you to show this child my grave. And I want you to tell this child what his, you know, who his mother was. That she loved this child more than anything else in the world and she gave up her life that this child should be able to live. Let this child know what I gave up so that this child could survive, that this child could live up to their potential. And the husband is sitting over there and he's crying and he's like, please reconsider. Maybe I could just give us another miracle. Maybe you could do that. And the wife kept on repeating, just tell the child what I gave up, that this child should survive. And she falls out of consciousness. Meanwhile, there's machines that are beeping. The doctors run in and says, what did you decide? What's going on? And the husband with tears streaking down the cheeks, he couldn't even say the words. And he says, the child. I gotta respect my wife, the child, that's what she wants. And as he's going out, he turns to the doctor and he says, Doc, if you're able to get them both survive, I'm signing off all my wealth to you. Do whatever you can to make them both survive. I'll give you everything. You'll have everything. The doctor goes and says, listen, he says, you know, like, everybody knows you. I would do it, for, if I could, I would. Trust me, I'm gonna try. But I can't promise, it's not looking good. He goes out to the waiting room, and just when he thought he had no more tears left, he started crying again. I could just baruch please save both of them, save my wife, save the child. An hour goes by, and the doctor comes out into the waiting room, and the husband looks at him, hoping to see a smile, but the doctor is just looking at him with no expression, and he starts crying. The husband starts crying again. He says, Doc, g give me the news. What, what, what's going on? So the doctor looks at him and he says, at one hand, you know, Mazel Tov, he had a baby girl. And the husband, before even saying Mazel Tov, he's like, and? And the doctor looks at him and he says, and Baruch Dainanis, what can I tell you? And the husband has this mixed emotions. At one side he has a child, at the other side he's lost his wife. He's going back and forth with crying and happiness, crying and happiness. Fast forward five years. Five years go by. And the father is walking with his little daughter. And they walk through the iron gates of the cemetery. And he's walking to a grave. And he bends down to his little daughter. And he says, you see this grave over here? And she says, yeah. Yeah, Tati, I see it. He says, this is your mommy. This is who your mommy is. Where is your mommy buried? He says, you know your mommy, she has the same name as you. And he starts explaining to her about what her mommy was and how amazing she, her mommy was and what she accomplished in this world. And then he goes and he says, you know, your mommy loved you so much that she was willing to give up her life so that you could survive. She wanted you so badly to survive that she was willing not to be here just so that you could be here. Says the Dibna Magid. Says we had a situation going on. We had the Jewish people and the Beis Amigdash. And there was a disease going around, and we'll soon explain why. There was a disease, and only one could be saved. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose the Beis Amigdash. And the Beis Amigdash goes and says, you know, the Beis Amigdash is the bias. It's the, the, the home of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's the mother. The Beis Amigdash says, I'll give up my life. But do me a favor. When my children get of age, and they're able to understand, Bring them to my tombstone. Bring them to the Kaisal Amaravi and tell them what I gave up so that they could survive. Tell them of what they had and what now they don't just so that they could survive. Do we realize, you know, it's so hard, it's Tisha B'Av, it's so many years ago, like can we even, it's more, it's almost 2,000 years ago, we're gonna be able to go, okay, how do we cry? How do we able to connect to something that happened so long ago? Because the base of Migdash, that was our home. That was the mother, the mother that gave up everything just so the children, the Bnei Yisrael, the Klai Yisrael, should survive. Coming into Tisha B'Av, think about this story. Think about the emotions that are running through you right now as you're hearing it. Think about what we lost and what we had. We had a mother. 
We had the base of Mikdash, the unbelievable base of Mikdash. We had a place where the Shekhinah rested. We had the home of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And one of us had to go. And unfortunately, or fortunately, which we'll soon see, the base of Mikdash went. But the question that we have to ask is, okay, so why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroy the base of Mikdash? Why does it have to be one or the other? Like, why does it have to be that way? Let us both be saved. And I want to share with you a beautiful idea from Rabbi Shem Pincus. That one of the reasons, and Rabbi Shem Pincus says very likely the key reason, was that the Beis HaMikdash had to be destroyed because of the very existence of the Beis HaMikdash itself. And he goes on to explain as follows. As in Yom Kippur, the Rambam in Hilchas Tshuva, the first parak, second, second halacha, goes and speaks about in the time of the Beis HaMikdash, there was a goat that was sent to Azazel. And this goat atoned for all the sins in the Torah. Light, severe, intentional, deliberate, unintentional, all the sins of the Torah, as long as you did tshuva, it atoned for it. You had a Beis HaMikdash. You came in, you came into the Beis HaMikdash, you know, diseased, you know, spiritually, you left pure. Technically. Rosh goes and says, this, even throughout the year, Someone did an Avera. You had a carbon option, right? You go to carbon and you're able to fix everything. And he goes and explains as follows. He says, imagine someone calls and uh, calls a stockbroker. And he says, you know, I want you to invest $50,000 in this stock. And the stockbroker takes down all the information, transfer the money. And all of a sudden, the yid, as he hangs up the phone, he slaps his forehead. He's like, wait a minute. He says, it's Shabbos today. How did I, like, what just happened? He like, I, I couldn't believe it. He runs over to the Rav. The Rav says, you got to go to the base of Medesh. You got to speak to the client. He runs over to the client. He says, you know, this is what happened. I says, I, you know, I, I called my, I didn't realize it was Shabbos. I was Mechal Shabbos. I called, I invested money. So the client says, you have to bring a carbon. So he says, oh, yeah, of course, of course. Well, you know, and he goes and he, and he finds a carbon. He takes the most juiciest carbon. He spends 10 grand on this carbon. And he goes and he brings this carbon. And now after a while, he's in the base of Migdash. He sees that you know, there's a donation fund that, that's going on. He donates you know, another $5,000 to Bede He feels terrible. He goes all out, 15 grand. A week goes by. The broker calls up and says, you're not going to believe it. He says, this company skyrocketed, the thing that you invested. He says, your $50,000 you know, your, your $50, investment is now worth over a half a million dollars, $500,000. Now this guy's thinking, he's like, wait a minute. He says, I invested $50,000. Yes, I had to bring a carbon. I gave a donation, $15,000. You know, like, but, you know, dealing with everything, I made a pretty nice profit. He says, explains to Rapshim because during the time of the base of Migdash, they lived life, unfortunately, towards the end of the, before the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. They lived life, they didn't live life feeling that they could be carefree. We had the Beis HaMikdash, you know, like, that would atone for all, that would take care of everything. Now people know that if you want to atone, you, want to, you, you need to do proper tshuva. You need to do proper that. But what happened was that people were growing more and more distant from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They were stepping back and back and back. They were focused on the world. Yes, they had issues and they were very connected. They went to the base of Midrash. They gave the donations. They did everything that they were supposed to outwardly. They did what they needed to do. But they were the artists and they were walking back and back and they were about to fall off the cliff. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is screaming at them, sending them the VM and, and, and you know, like, like, be careful, watch where you're going, you're going to fall to your abyss, you're going to fall to your spiritual death. But people were too mesmerized by the painting of the world and they couldn't listen. So there was only one choice, one option that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had. He had to destroy the painting, he had to destroy the base Migdash, so that people wake up and be like, wait a minute, like, what's going on? Like, where are we? How far have we fallen? And this is why the Medrash says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu poured out his wrath on the sticks and stones. Like, imagine you have a, a child that rides his bike very dangerously, not very carefully, in the street, out of the street, doesn't look, doesn't know anything. So the father could go and either smack him up and says, you better be careful, who knows, what could happen? You're going to get hit by a car, unfortunately. Or the father could go and say, like, you know what, you're obviously not mature enough to ride a bike. He takes a bike and he destroys the bike. Not because he's venting his anger on the bike, he's saving the child. The child is not old enough, not smart enough, not capable to be able to be careful while riding the bike. So the father has no choice but other than to just destroy the bike. This is why the Tehillim starts off Mizmar La Asaf, a song for Asaf. Yes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroyed the base of Mikdash, but he did that to save the child, the children, the Klal Yisrael, 
who were too focused on the painting, too focused on the world, they didn't see the big picture, and they were going to fall to the spiritual abyss. Let's understand this concept a little more clearly. The Gemara in Gittin, page 56a, goes and tells a story about the destruction of the second base of English, where you have Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. He went and he had to be smuggled out of Yerushalayim to speak to the, you know, the Roman general at that time, Vespasian. And the reason why he had to sneak out is because there was a, a, a group of Jewish people that wanted to fight the Romans. And then you have a group of Jewish people that just wanted to surrender to them and says, you know, let's make peace, let's work it out. The Rabbanim were in the group that wanted to make peace and work it out with the Romans. They saw that it's not going to work. But you had the Biryanim, you had the Zilots, they wanted to go and they wanted to fight. And if the Zilots saw that people wanted to go make peace, they went and they destroyed them. It says, we're not giving up, we're going to fight. Unfortunately, it was a wrong choice. But Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he wanted to somehow speak to the, you know, to, to the Roman general. Maybe he'd be able to, to, to make some sort of deal. So in order for him to be able to sneak out, he had to pretend to be dead. And he was able to go out. Finally, he gets to the Vespasian. He gets to the Roman general. And he goes over to the Roman general. And he goes and he says, Shalma Allah Malka. He says, peace unto you, king. And the Vespasian, which was a general at that time, he says, you deserve death on two accounts, says the Gemara. Uh, number one, the fact that I'm not king. How dare you call me king? Number two, if I am king, then what took you so long to get out of here? We had a siege under Jerusalem for a long time. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai responded, and he says, really you are king and you're going to be king because Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, is not going to fall only, only to a king. And number two, you asked me why I didn't come out here earlier. He says, you know, he explained them the situation. He says, we have people over there that don't let us leave. He says, we try, but we can't. It was very difficult. So Vespasian responded, it says, if you have a jar of honey that attract a poisonous snake, what would you do? You would break the jar in order to get rid of the snake. And Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai didn't respond. And then Mepharshim, you know, asked, like, why didn't he respond? You, the response was simple. The response is, why would you break the jar of honey? You get tongs, you get something with a stick, and you get rid of the stake, you save the honey. Why destroy the jar? Why destroy the honey? Because when Rabbi Victor Miller goes and explains, he says, when Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai heard the general's words, he heard of what HaKadosh Baruch Hu was pronouncing, what, what, they were, what they were announcing in Shemayim, that Yerushalayim has to be destroyed in order to save the people from a greater destruction. The people were too mesmerized by the painting, they, they needed to, the, the painting needed to be destroyed. And if you think about it, you look at the history, you look at the first base of Mikdash. The first base of Mikdash, there were some kings of Yehuda, some king of Yis you know, Yisrael that were, were not good kings, or very, very wicked kings. You had Achaz, you had Menashe, you had Yoachim, you had, you had kings that they, they forced B'nai Yisrael to do Averas, to do a, the, on the lowest level. But then what happened? The base of Mikdash was destroyed, and who came out afterwards? You had Ezra, you had Nehemiah, you had Zerubbabel, you had Tzaddikim that came out afterwards. You have the second base of Migdash. Uh, towards the end of the second base of Migdash was, was ruled by the Herodian dynasty. These were not, you know, great rulers. Again, you had some, you know, little parts where they were okay, but overall, they were bad rulers. They were not rulers who were following the Torah. And Akadosh Baruch Hu says, I have to destroy it. It says, you're, 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 you're too mesmerized by the painting. And Akadosh Baruch Hu destroyed the base of Migdash. And who came? Who was the leaders? Rabbi Yochan ben Zaka, Yad Rabbi Gamliel, Yad other tzaddikim. You had the people over there that they were stuck in a certain space. They were with the tzedukim. They were with, unfortunately, the wrong side. And Akadus Baruch had no choice. He had to destroy the bike. He had to destroy the painting. He had to go and destroy because there was only one that were going to survive. And Rav Shem Shabika says, it takes us a step further. It says, it seems. That's also the purpose of the Holocaust. Before the Holocaust, you know, the Germans, the Jewish you know, people that lived in Germany and, and Poland, that area, there was a danger, and unfortunately the danger actualized, where people went off. The Haskalah movement, they went off, they became the reform, the conservative. They were leaving. To the point, Sir Pshipshap Pikas goes and says that his father-in-law lived in a town of Bransk. And this town, he says, his father-in-law and one other guy were the only yeshiva bacham in town. And if they would go to the store, they didn't want to leave their house because it was embarrassing. Oh, you're a yeshiva bachar? Like it was an embarrassing, now you're a yeshiva bachar. Wow, you know, it's unbelievable. But back then it was a yeshiva bachar. What are you doing? Why are you not in university? Why don't you don't do something with your life? Why don't you go and succeed in your life? You're sitting over there learning Torah. That's what you're spending your time with. And if you would go to the store over there, they would have to wait all the way in the back. Everybody else, the servants, the maids, everybody would go first and then the yeshiva bachar would come. 
People, they would avoid living it because you have to be in the university. What are you wasting your time with this? So what did Akadosh Baruch do? Akadosh Baruch had to break the jar of honey. He had to break it. You know, it, it's during the time of, of the base of Mikdash, there was warnings. The, you know, the Navi Yirmiyahu went and he warned. He says, how many times? You're going to steal? You're going to murder? You're going to commit, you know, adultery? You're going to swear falsely? You're going to, you know, worship the Baal? And, uh, and then you're going to come to the base of Mikdash and offer your kabbanas? And well, we're okay. You know, we did our kabbanas. We did what we're supposed to do. You know, we did what we're supposed to do. Yirmiyahu, he spoke very strongly. He went and he gave the Yidin Musar. Unfortunately, they didn't listen. People were not shaken by it. Before the Holocaust, there was mustard that was giving, going, going, throwing out. And not only that, Shem Shem Pinkus even brings down that it was even coming from Hitler himself, Yimach uh, Yeah, Hitler, the, the, the decrees, that some of the decrees that came out sounded like they were coming from a Rosh Hashiva, not from Hitler. Not from that. A Jew is not allowed to live with a non-Jew. Who's speaking over here? The Rosh Hashiva or the, the, the other side? What's going on? He says, oh, you know, a Jew is not allowed to go to the non-Jewish university. Is this, who's saying this stuff? A Jew is not allowed to marry a non-Jew. You would think this is a muster smooth that's going on over here. You, but what happened over here? The Hitler was giving this decree. There was, there was signs that were going on. Be like, you guys are falling. And what's going to happen? I have to wake you up. So either I'm going to have to destroy something, the European Jewry, or you're going to wake up. But unfortunately, we didn't wake up and the European Jewry was destroyed. We didn't wake up. The second base of English was destroyed. We didn't wake up. You know, unfortunately, the first base of English was destroyed. The Spanish Inquisition, you can think about all the destruction, what's going on. We go, we get comfortable. And we think we're cool, we're good. Me and God, we're tight. We have an understanding. And Agnes Baruch sends you signs after signs after signs, and we don't wake up. You think about it nowadays. You know, are we any better? I really hope we are. But sometimes when you're in the mud, when you're in the garbage, you can't smell the garbage. If you take a step back, so are, are we? Are we doing good? Like, yeah, you know, like, okay, we're, we're davening, we're listening to Torah classes, Baruch Hashem. But like, are we? Are we listening to Torah classes? Are we davening? How many times are we daven? And then we're like, what did we just say? Did we daven? Like, does that even count? You know, like, you're listening to a Torah class, but you're spacing out about what you need, uh, so many other things that you tune in and you tune out. You're sitting there, you listen to a Torah class, you hear an idea, do you actually do something? Do you change it? Do you take that into your life and become a better person? Oh, we hear it. Yeah, we know. It makes us feel good. We listen to our classes. You have some guys screaming, saying stories. It gets emotional. It gets tearful. It's enjoyable. It's entertaining. So it's good. But do we take anything out of it? Do we leave a different person? Can we say that we're different? It's a scary thought. It's a very, very scary thought. I want to say that I would love to say, and, and I think, you know, Baruch Hashem, we're, it's, it, it, it feels like we're doing pretty good at one side. Right, Baruch Hashem, we have Torah spreading like never before. You have Torah anytime. You have all these, you know, like so much Torah being spread out and so much Torah being listening and learned. And there's like so much good that goes out there. But I venture to say, and I'm speaking to myself also, like the information is out there. And it's external, it's there. And, and we hear it, but do we internalize it? Do we take it to the next level and internalize it? Each one has to ask you, you know, maybe yes, maybe not. You have to ask yourself that question. You know, imagine you had a, this is the young boy. And this young boy had an infection. And the, the father runs over to the doctor and he says, you got you know, there's an infection on the foot. You got to do something. And the doctor says, really, what has to happen is, is that this foot has to come off. Otherwise, the infection is going to spread. So the, doc, the father says, do whatever you can to say, my boy is not doing well. And the doctor says, but, you know, to be honest, says your boy is not, he doesn't look good. He says, I can't risk it. He says, he might not make, I can't, I can't do it. And the father says, you got me, you're the doctor. He says, I, I, I can't, I, you know, it's too dangerous, I can't do it. And the father runs to another doctor, and each doctor refuses. The father says, what am I going to do? Is he going to let this boy die? He runs over to the mohel, and he says, listen, you, at least you do some operation, and chop it off. And the mohel looks at it and says, this is not my expertise. He says, I can't do this. He goes to the butcher. He says, maybe you could help me. The tears in his eyes, maybe you could help me save my son. The butcher says, I don't deal with live human beings. This is not my department. The father takes the boy home, puts him on the, you know, this marble stone, and he ties him down. And the little boy very weakly looks up to his father and says, you know, Daddy, what are you, what are you doing? And the father with tears in his eyes says, I'm trying to save you. 
And the boy doesn't understand why is his father tying him. And then the boy looks and says, he doesn't understand why is his father holding a very sharp knife. And with tears in his eyes, the father chops, starts you know, tying off the foot and starts taking off the infection. And the boy starts screaming and says, Father, why are you hurting me? Why are you doing this to me? And the father is crying and he says, I'm just trying to save you. This is the only way that you're going to survive. The month on which the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed is called Av. The only month that is called Av. Av is a father. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know, destroyed us. But as a father destroys a child, what is it just for our survival? Shafa Hamasa ala Eitzim ala Vadim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu took his, his chema, his wrath, on the sticks and stones, on the base of Migdash, to save the Jewish people. So where does that hold us? Where are we holding? Do we realize that we had the base of Migdash, we had a mother that gave up? Or do we forget about the base of Migdash? Be like, mother, what, what, what base I make this? Like, what, what are you talking? It's like it was so many years ago. Like, I, you know, I can't, I can't be guitar. Like, what does that have to do with me? I want to share with you a story. This is a story that's written by Rabbi Chil Spiro. And the story about a boy, a 15 year old boy, Yaakov Vaslivik, if I'm pronouncing his name right. A boy that grew up in a secular background and he immigrated from Poland. And at 15 years old, he got enrolled to the Talmudic Academy in Baltimore. But he didn't know a thing about Judaism. He didn't know a thing about Aleph base. So you have to start from the bottom. But he was very motivated to learn. To tell you how much his motivation was, he went, and as a 15-year-old, he went to the second grade. A 15-year-old sitting with a bunch of seven-year-olds, less than half his age. And he's sitting over there. He's learning the Aleph base. He's learning how to read. He's learning everything that he needs to. And a few months go by. They say, okay, you ready to go to the next grade? And they skip into sixth grade, and he's learning, and he's, he's accomplishing. And before the year is over, he's in seventh grade. And the Rebbe is learning Gemara. And again, this boy, you know, he's, he's advancing, but like he's still, you know, just started. And, you know, it was very, very difficult for him to comprehend, you know, to, you know, the, the, and it just shows you, like, if he didn't understand something, it bothered him. It's like, no, no, I, I need to understand this. And if he didn't get it, and if the Rebbe explained it again and again and again, you saw the tears in this 15-year-old boy, and he was in seventh grade, you know, sitting with a bunch of 12-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, he's sitting over there with tears in his eyes. Rebbe, please explain it to me again. That is the devotion that this boy had. The Rebbe explained to him until finally he got it, and then the Rebbe went on to explain about the mitzvah of Bikurim. Bikurim is the first fruit that are brought to the base of Meidash. Now, for the people that live near Yerushalayim, they could bring the fresh fruit because by the time they leave their house, so they get to Yerushalayim, the fruit is still fresh. But if you add people that live further away, by the time they travel, it's not like now that you could travel within a few hours anywhere around there to Israel, you can get to Yerushalayim, but it takes time. And if it takes time, the fruit can spoil. And you don't want to bring fo spoiled fruit to Yerushalayim, to, to the base of Megdash, this is Bikurim. So what people used to do is, people that live further away, they would bring dry fruit. So you had people that bring the fresh fruit and you had people that bring the dry fruit. And this Rebbe went and utilized this concept, this idea, as a Musar Shmuz to go and go and to, to speak Musa about the you know, people and their service to God. You have some people that serve God as fresh fruit, and you have some people that serve God as you know, dried fruit. You have some people that serve God that they come from a religious background, they come from a religious home, they come from a place where they were, you know, you know, Torah and, and Yiddishkeit and Judaism was uh, looked up for, and, and this is what it was focused, and they come in with fresh fruit to serve Takadish Baruch Hu, to God. And then you have people that come in from, you know, backgrounds that wasn't so in inducive for spiritual growth. It wasn't so, you know, easy to go and to learn because the parents were very angry, very upset. What are you doing? The grandparents was, what are you, I don't understand what are you doing. The, the whole school system, they were, in, they were in, a, in an environment that wasn't conducive for growth, for growth. So, but they ended up trying. And they brought, they came with whatever spirituality they, were, they had. And they brought their dried fruit. So the rabbi goes and says, both are accepted, Takadish Baruch Hu. You have people with fresh fruit, and you have people with dried fruit. Both are accepted, Takadish Baruch Hu. And the rabbi was trying to give, you know, like help this boy. He says, even though you come from back home, but it's still acceptable. But the boy didn't, you know, ask a question. He raised his hand. And with tears in his eyes, he says, Rebbe, Rabbi, he 
what type of fruit am I bringing? And the rabbi thought it was clear, you know, like, uh, says, what type of fruit am I bringing? And the rabbi said, I want to share with you a story. There was once a very, very wealthy family. Tremendous amount of wealth. They were, you know, they had, they had property, they had land. They, they were very close to the king. And uh, one day, unfortunately, their magnificent palace, the huge palace, burned to the ground. And the fa there was a large family. And the father, you know, thank God, Bar Hashem, all the kids and the, and the parents were saved. But the father goes over to the children and says, listen, we have to build. And he says, you know, right now we don't have enough room for everybody to stay, you know, together. So what we're going to do is, is that we're going to go and we're going to send each child to another place to live until we build the palace. And then I will call everybody back. And then we'll be reunited once again. And uh, the father, you know, makes a few phone calls, makes a, uh, the arrangements. And, you know, the, the oldest child comes, a nice beautiful carriage pulls up and it takes this child to, you know, a different, uh, different home. Every child goes and goes into this, in this magnificent carriage, magnificent, magnificent boat, wherever they're going to, and they get settled in their, in their new home. And they're treated like royalty, like they really are. They, get, they go and they go to the tailor and they get a full new wardrobe. They're able to go and treat it the way that they ought to be treated. And there was this little nine-year-old girl, this nine-year-old Rachel, She's sitting and she's thinking, okay, also, I'm going to be like a princess, you know, daddy's a little girl, that's all I was. And she's waiting for the, you know, her, her carriage to come. And this rackety carriage comes and shows up. And she says, you know what, it's probably this ending, you know, probably going to have something amazing. And they pick her up and they bring her to this home. And she thinks she's going to be treated the way that she was treated. But to her dismay, she goes and she comes in. The first thing that they give her is they give her a mop and a bucket. And they say, start cleaning. And she's like, what? She, they're like, you have chores, you have to do something, you have to work for yourself. And she's sitting over there, she was a good girl, she didn't know what to do, so she started mopping. And after they mopping, they said, now you clean the toilets, and now you gotta do, and she was sitting over there with her beautiful little white dress, the only dress that she came, she thought she was gonna get a new wardrobe. Everything else burned down. She's sitting over there and she's cleaning. The owners of the house look at it and says, what, you're going to clean in this white dress? And they threw her some rags. says, this is what you clean with. He says, you're not a princess over here. She took her dress off. She, she hangs, it up, hangs it up in her room. And she's sitting over there with tears in her eyes. She's scrubbing the floors. At the end of the day, she goes into her room. And her hair is knotty. She's all dirty. She tries to wash herself off. And she's, she's so emotional. She, has no, she puts on her dress and she starts, you know, combing her hair, trying to take out the knots and, you know, saying like, listen, this is only temporary. One day I'm going to be reunited with my family. I'm going to be reunited with my father and my mother. I'm going to be reunited and go into the, my, in my palace and this is only temporary. But unfortunately, the days turn to weeks, which turns to months, which end up turning to years. And at this point, she didn't even fit to the dress anymore. She was only able to look at it. And at a certain point, she even forgot about it. All she knew was the maid that she was. She would clean, she hasn't showered in who knows how long. Her face is dirty, her clothing are dirty, everything is dirty. And this is her life. Years go by, and there's a letter that comes. And there's a letter with a servant saying that your father's palace is rebuilt, you're welcome home. And she remembers, she's like, oh. Has it been like six, seven years? She's 15, 16 years old right now. She goes, this is my father's palace. Says, Wait, how am I going to go? She looks at herself. She's like, I can't go like this. And she looks, she has a nine-year-old dress over there. Says, that's all I have. What is she going to do? She starts combing to the best of her ability. She takes the dress. Somehow she's able to maneuver it. It expands. Don't ask questions on the story. It worked. She gets into this dress barely, right? It's smiling in all angles. Let's just leave it at that. And... <clears throat> She goes and she travels to her new palace, to her family. The father is sitting over there and the mother and they're welcoming each child. It's been so long. They're hugging and kissing. Every child comes in with a magnificent carriage dressed in royalty and the father and mother are crying and saying, wow, so happy, Baruch Hashem, you're back home. And then her carriage shows up and then she steps out and she doesn't look like all the other children. She looks dirty. She looks like she went through something. The father and mother took one look at her and they burst out of tears. They ran over and they gave her such a hug they wouldn't let go. And they realized what she went through. And they realized what she's gone through, but she says, don't worry, now you're home. The Rebbe goes on and says, one day there's going to be a letter that arrives. There's going to be a big shofar that comes out. Mashiach is going to come and he's going to tell all the children, come back home. 
And we were all once, we all had a magnificent palace called the Beis HaMikdash. And we all were royalty, spiritual royalty. We were on the top of the top. But then the, the palace was destroyed, was burnt down. And we were all sent to different parts of the world, the different families, the different environments. Some of them were healthy spiritual environments. And we're going to come to Mashiach dressed in all nice, like we're here. We've been religious, we've done, and we've done everything. But then there are people that had to come and be like, with tattered clothes, it says, I was not in that same environment. I was in an environment called America. It wasn't so conducive to spiritual growth. We had yeshivas, we had that, but, but you know, like, uh, uh, we, we tried, but we couldn't. To be ashamed and embarrassed. The dried fruits that we bring. But Mashiach is going to take one look at those people. The people that wanted so badly, they put on that white dress because they tried so hard. They tried so hard. Those are the people that he's not going to let go. Those are the people that he's not going to want to let go and be like, I realize where you went through and where you came. And he goes over to this boy, Yaakov, and he says, you, you're a mevakish. You're one who's constantly striving to seek and understand HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You're a 15-year-old sitting with a bunch of 12-year-olds and 7-year-olds trying to understand it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to take one look at you. He's never letting you go. He says, what you went through to get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Mashiach is going to come, what are we going to say? Are we going to come and be like, oh, no, no, we're religious, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, oh, come on, you know, like, we go and we listen to Torah classes, we give Torah classes, we look from, right, we dress the part, we do the davening thing, right, we know how to hold our hand in a siddur, we do the words thing, we say it, you know, we say thank you, we do the bracha sometimes when we're in Mandarin, we do the bracha, chorna. like, we're religious, we're good, we're going to bring, like, really? Is that where we're holding? Is that where we are? Maybe we should be a little realistic of where we're holding. We might not be on the top of the top, but we could try, we could be a mevakish, we could strive to be the, the best that we can. We may not get there, but if we try, if we tell like the Baruch we hear the signs, if the Beit Samikdash is not rebuilt, that means it was destroyed in our generation. So if we could tell like the Baruch you know what? Like, I know I'm not there yet. I have tattered clothes, I have ripped clothes, spiritually speaking. But I want to know you. I know that there was a base, I mean, there was a home, there was a mother, and that she gave up her life for that I could survive. I will never forget that. I see the kaisal, I realize of what the base, I mean, this gave up. And I'm going to try. Let us learn the lesson from the first base of Mikdash, from the second base of Mikdash, from the Holocaust, from the Spanish Inquisitions. There were times where we were taking steps and step back and we were looking at the big picture, what we thought the big picture was. And I can just borrow, had to rip up the picture because realize we would fall to spiritual abyss, to spiritual death. So we had to tell Akadosh Baruch we hear you. We hear the lessons, we're going to try. We may not be perfect, but we're going to try to be a mevakish, to be someone that goes and connects to Akadosh Baruch Hu. The Kuzari brings down one of the reasons that the prayers for rebuilding the base of Migdash have not been answered because we don't really mean what we're saying. We say the words, we, we, do, we go through the motions, but we're outside. Everything is great outside. The base of Migdash, we did everything right. We brought the Karbanas, we were good. God, we're good. Where was the inside? The fact was that we were missing something. How did we go and fall so far because our inside wasn't matching our outside? How do we prevent ourselves by thinking that we're okay? The people in the destruction of the second base of Megadosh, they were okay. We're do, we, no, we do it, we, we go, we bring a carbon, we do what we're supposed to be doing. But that cause has because the spiritual abyss to fall down. So how do we prevent that we are okay situation? It should be a wake up call to each and every single one of us. Where we're thinking, are we okay? Maybe the next time you daven, try to daven. Maybe the next time that you hear a shear, take something and change your life from it. You come to Tisha B'av. Hopefully it shouldn't happen this year. We should have Mashiach come. But this small event, the small chance that it's here. Do you mourn for the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash? Do you connect to it? Or is it all external? We're sitting over there. Yeah, we're sad because why? We can't eat. And I didn't have my coffee, so you know, I'm going through my migraines. I can't do How many hours left? Oh, yeah, all of these hours left. What could I watch to go, thank God for Torah anytime. Because if not for Torah anytime, who knows 
how much other shtusim we be involved in to just try to pass the time. Yes, fasting is difficult, and, and we want it to go fast, and I wish you all to have an easy and meaningful fast. But at least you're fasting, take a moment. Maybe you can't do it the whole day, but take a moment, lock yourself up in the room, sit on the floor, read a kin in English or something, make yourself cry, feel it. The base that Megdash gave up, it says, don't forget of what I gave up for you to be able to survive. Let us not go through this motion of just like, we're just going through it and we're, we're, we're okay. <laughs> we're listening to Torah classes. I mean, you're listening to this. You must be amazing. You're listening to Torah class. You're learning when other people are not. Don't fool yourselves. We have to realize that inside we have to work on ourselves. We have to change who we are. We have to become better people. We have to become a mevakesh, a someone that goes and strives to get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu at no matter what. And it's not easy. It's easier said than done, I'll tell you that much. But it's something we have to strive for and we have to work on each and every single day. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu help us and guide us to become a true mevakesh. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu also help us that we should see, we shouldn't be mesmerized by the painting of the world and realize where our spirituality stands. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu shouldn't have to destroy anything else, but rather rebuild a base Amigdash because we could realize that what is HaKadosh Baruch Hu? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is everything and there's nothing else. And with that, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu help us that we see Mashiach, the Meher Be'amenu. Amen. We'll open up to questions. No questions. Amazing. So I wish you all a easy, meaningful fast. A fast that we're able to accomplish a lot and dig deep this time dig deep go inside lock yourself up in a room in a closet sit on the floor just try try to get one tear for the base of English one tear for that mother that gave up everything that you're able to survive right here right now